In this episode, we will be taking the Lesage concept and introducing the notion of a light ether. This will overcome many of the limitations of the Lesage model and creates a self-perpetuating system. So let's explore Tom van Flanders' push gravity model. The key to understanding relativity in a quantum gravity, in other words, using particles smaller than an atom, is to be familiar with the flat space interpretation of general relativity, and to appreciate that the medium responsible for the transmission of light waves is not the graviton medium. The speed at which waves propagate through any medium is always close to the speed of motion of the principal constituent of that medium. If we take a gas, the wave speed is the square root 5 over 3 of the speed of the particles in the gas. As we have previously discussed, the gravitons must travel many orders of magnitude faster than the speed of light. This means that the wave speed in the graviton medium must be much faster than that of the speed of light. In this concept, the graviton medium needs to be considered similar to air, where the molecules are capable of transmitting energy in longitudinal waves like sound and not transverse waves like light. So the graviton medium and the light medium must be separate and distinct mediums, but they occupy the same space-time. This would be similar to considering an ocean of continuous water molecules at one scale and as a medium for discrete baryons at a much smaller scale but both occupying the same space at the same time. If we consider that the light medium and the graviton medium are separate, then it follows that the light medium must be affected by the graviton medium. Two possibilities arise. The light medium might be a compressible medium, in which case it will become denser near masses because of the compaction of gravitons. The other possibility is that the light medium might be an incompressible medium, in which case the pressure rises with medium depth near to masses. In both cases, the increase in density or the increase in pressure will give rise to a refraction phenomena for any waves passing through the light medium. This means that light passing near the sun will be bent by refraction in the light medium. Changes in the density or the pressure of the light medium only need to be proportional to the changes in the gravitational potential. This phenomena is also responsible for two other general relativity effects, gravitational redshift and radar time delay. The first is normally manifest in the slowing of clocks in the presence of a strong gravitational potential, and the second by slowing or propagation of radar signals between planets. These are exactly analogous to the refraction phenomena, which is itself a consequence of the slowed propagation speed for light waves in a denser light medium. Tom van Flander goes on to show that the formulas for each one of these situations and demonstrates that they are equivalent to the general relativity formulas. There is one special relativity effect that is difficult to account for in the Lesagian model and that is the advance of perihelion effect. A satisfactory explanation for this effect using the Lesagian gravity model has been lacking. We know that Mercury's mass makes no significant contribution to its own perihelion motion. If matter is always treated as an ensemble of particles with purely ballistic motion, the light medium would not contribute anything to the perihelion advance. Electrons, however, are not particles with purely ballistic motions. They have strong wave-like properties and are the main reason that light is considered an electromagnetic phenomena. In fact, one of Louis de Broglie's chief contributions to physics was demonstrating that ordinary matter has wave properties too. It is therefore important to consider that the electrons in orbiting bodies will be influenced by the density of the light medium that they travel through. This therefore means that the elliptical motion of orbiting bodies is slowed most by the light medium near perihelion, where the medium is at its densest, and is slowed least near aphelion, 
where the light medium is least dense or has lower pressure. This velocity difference will cause the elliptical orbit to rotate forwards. Again, in his paper he goes into details showing how the formulas for this model are constructed and how they are equivalent to general relativity. General relativity also predicts gravitational waves. And in this model, these are waves in the light medium generated by the orbital motion of one body around another. And these would end up being indistinguishable from very long wavelength electromagnetic waves. Both light waves and gravitational waves have been described as disturbances in space-time. Now we can see that they are waves in the same medium having the same speed but different wavelengths. It is important to appreciate that gravitational waves have no connection with the conveyance of gravitational forces or of changes in those forces. An important distinction with this model compared to the standard gravity is that gravitons cannot have an infinite range like the standard model. This is because sooner or later they will end up striking something or cease to convey their message from the source. If nothing will get in its way, they will travel until they hit another graviton and get scattered. This is an important characteristic of a Lesagean gravity model. This shortened range could explain why galaxies rotate as they do, as gravity plays no part in this rotation, but gravity may still act at the level below stars forming filaments. In the previous episode, we have discussed that these particles could either be absorbed by matter to cause the force, or be scattered. The problem with the first is that this would cause matter to heat up and eventually incinerate. Tom van Flanders' solution to this relates to the concept that the light medium becomes denser around more massive objects, and this means that some of the gravitons could be absorbed or scattered by this medium as well. It effectively increases the surface area of the objects. He also envisions that both absorption and scattering would take place. Absorption would be rarer and could take place in the light medium or in the object itself. If it occurred in the light medium, this heat energy would quickly dissipate into the cooler parts of the medium. If it was absorbed in the body, it would contribute to a slow heating effect and this would happen much less often compared to the scattering or the absorption in the light medium. An interesting implication from this is that if you were able to shield something from all gravitons, it would theoretically be possible to lower the definition of absolute zero. So what evidence is there to support some of these new properties of gravity? Let's start with the speed of gravity. We have covered this in the first episode of the gravity series, but there are some experiments which show very clearly that there is no lag in the propagation of gravity. Number one, experiments performed to update the Laplace experiment show that there is an absence of any change in the angular momentum of Earth's orbit, which is a necessary accompaniment of any propagation delay. Number two, detailed studies of binary pulsars also show there is no lag. Number three, an experiment performed during a solar eclipse showed that the optical and gravitational eclipses do not coincide. Number four, planetary ranging shows that the Earth's gravitational acceleration towards the Sun does not coincide with the arriving solar photons. And number five, the walker dual experiment showing that changes in both gravitational and electrostatic field propagate faster than the speed of light. And so the list does go on. In his paper you can read the full list and where to find out the sources for each one of those experiments. The pulsar data places the strongest lower limit on the speed of propagation at 2 times 10 to the power of 10 times the speed of light. So let's talk about the finite range of gravity. In his paper, he goes on to revise the formula for gravitational acceleration, but I'm not going to go into the detail here. A finite range of gravity would result in a gravitational constant progressively decreasing away from the Sun. The largest observable consequence of this would be an apparent rotation of the radar reference frame with respect to the optical reference frame. 
The predicted effect would be that the radar mean motion of the Earth's solar orbit would exceed its optical mean motion by a certain amount. And such a discrepancy is actually observed and has a magnitude close to the one that he predicts in his paper and has remained an unexplained puzzle over the past decade. And this would put the range for gravity at about one kiloparsec or about 3000 light years. Heat flows. The absorption of gravitons would create internal heating in planets through processes which would probably manifest itself as radioactivity and spontaneous emission of photons. We would expect the heat generated to be directly proportional to the mass. So the question is whether we observe this in the planets within our solar system. When we examine these, we do indeed see a correlation that the more massive a body is, the greater the heat generation is. Unfortunately, the data is not compelling enough to suggest that this is the only cause for heating. But remember, in the mainstream exclamation for heating, this varies from planet to planet. So let's now examine how both the light medium and the gravity medium can fit together into a complete model. Let's start by imagining a discrete medium of high speed gravitons. Occasionally, a matter object absorbs a colliding graviton. And this will remove some of the flux and the energy from the gravitational medium and transfer it to the matter object. This momentum transfer will propel the matter object. The net propulsion of the matter object, which is caused by the arriving gravitons from all directions, is its gravitational acceleration, which in the end will be towards any large mass that blocks a substantial number of these gravitons. The speed of the gravitons is so fast that the direction of acceleration coincides with the true instantaneous direction of the nearby large mass. If the large mass is sufficiently far away, let's say at least 3000 light years, then stray gravitons may get scattered to fill in for some of the missing ones, blocked by the mass, diluting its gravitational force. Gradually from the accumulated graviton impacts, the matter object accretes mass and energy and heats up. This process continues until the matter object passes some critical threshold and explosively releases the excess stored energy or mass. And this explosion may produce a shock wave in the light medium, which would then appear to the observer on our scale as a spontaneous emission of a photon. The same phenomena on a much larger scale may be called a planetary explosion or a nova. Alternatively, the exploding matter object may eject mass. This would appear to an observer on our scale to be a particle decay, releasing an alpha or a beta particle. On a larger scale, we might talk about the ejection of a neutron star or a planetary nebula in a supernova explosion. Tiny bits from the matter explosion will return to the gravity medium, restoring their numbers. At a smaller scale, this phenomena would be called radioactivity and excess heat flow in planets. A spontaneously emitted photon as it leaves the matter body propagates through space as a light wave. Normally, it will encounter nothing except the gravity medium. Whenever two mediums interact, friction can occur just like the sea interacts with the air above it. If waves propagate along the surface, then the air above will remove some of its energy, causing the waves to diminish in height and increase in wavelength. In other words, they will become redshifted and fainter as they travel. The gravitons are so small in comparison to light waves that no significant scattering or refraction takes place. This removes one of the main objections to the tired light models, as an explanation for cosmological redshift. This mechanism also restores the energy to the graviton medium, which is lost when the gravitons were absorbed by matter objects that later emit the light wave. This extra energy ensures that the average speed of the graviton is always maintained. When a new matter object forms from an interstellar cloud, this balance is once more restored. Numbers, energy, and momentum are all balanced. The universe is not heating up nor cooling down. 
Now Tom makes two additional points. According to the second law of thermodynamics, entropy, the disorder in our universe, is always increasing. When looking at this model, it becomes obvious that if you sample on a certain scale, it will indeed appear as if entropy is always increasing. If, however, we sample on a scale where gravity dominates, then we will see that this appears to decrease, meaning that the universe is becoming more ordered. Gravity tends to condense bodies to form galaxies, stars, planets, out of a highly disordered cloud of gas and dust. This is creating order from disorder. And when we consider the entire cycle in this model, both order creating and order destroying processes participate, leaving no net change to the entropy of the universe. And this is consistent with a universe that is infinite and has existed forever. Now one more consequence of this model besides the redshift of light is that all light must also suffer a decrease in amplitude corresponding to a decrease in intensity. And when we observe the intensity drop-off for distant galaxies which have been redshifted, we see that this drop-off does not correspond to the predicted drop-off for the Big Bang scenario, which predicted a drop-off of 1 plus Z, where Z is the redshift, to the power of minus 4. And what is actually observed is much closer to 1 plus Z to the power of minus 2 which is exactly what this model actually predicts. So by adopting a Lesage-style push-gravity model and introducing the concept of a light medium, Tom van Vlaanderen has been able to produce a model which not only is in accordance with Newtonian gravity, but also with general and special relativity phenomena. In his paper, he goes into a lot more detail on proving these particular points so if you are interested, I would highly recommend you read this paper. For me, this is an important piece of work which glues many different concepts into one. As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.